Hello everyone, welcome to Good Film Hunting, a podcast about an average couple who are on the hunt for some good movies. In today's world, we are consuming more media than ever, perhaps more passively than ever. But we believe that by documenting and discussing the media we intake, how and what we intake will change for the better. It is important that we don't just become another consumer, but a participant, seeking to engage with the media we consume, so that we can see how our view of the world affects how we perceive it, and how it affects how we perceive the world. In this podcast, we are not only on the hunt for some good movies, but on the hunt for a good discussion. So, lean in, participate, and enjoy. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to another session of Good Film Hunting, where we're here talking about, well, this time not a film, but something in a similar vein. Um, James here, as always, and beside me is... Savannah. Yeah, that's her. Mm -hmm. That's her. We're here. Um, See, so yeah, how are you doing? Doing pretty good. Pretty good? A little tired. A little tired, as always. As always, but... Be expected. Other than that, good. Mm -hmm. My... The beans from tonight are in my stomach. Care to elaborate on that, or are we just going to leave it at that? <laughs> no, I, I undercooked the beans for dinner tonight slightly because they were in the pressure cooker and it was just taking longer than I expected. So we ate partially cooked beans tonight. So I feel them in my stomach, but we'll be okay. Well, that's what she says, but who knows? That's true. Actually, well, it doesn't feel too bad. I feel better now that I had Tums, so we'll see. Oh, there we we'll go. see how the evening progresses. <laughs> Hopefully... Hopefully, uh, better. It's true. So, are you excited for this particular subject tonight? The yeah. particular movie? Yeah, I am. I'm looking forward to talking about it with looking you. Looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. I haven't, yeah, I haven't heard all your thoughts on this one. So, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, too. To mm -hmm. hear what you were, what you truly thought. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, if you didn't know already, which you probably do, we are talking about the... TV series, Avatar, The Last Airbender. We just got done with this. Um, so yeah, once again, our overall episode structure starts with me listing out some facts for Savannah um, that she might know or not know. And then we'll go into our general thoughts and opinions and history about the, the show or the media we um, consumed, I guess. That's the best way to put it. <laughs> and then we'll go into a very uh, spoiler-heavy conversation about certain aspects. Usually it's our rating system. Uh, this time it will be a bit different. We'll be talking about the individual seasons. And uh, this time, I, instead of just the three seasons, I also included the um, ending in that because I kind of thought that was standout enough to talk about. Um, then we'll have our new edition, the Tom Hanks section, where <laughs> Tom Hanks has to replace someone somewhere. And then we'll, uh, we have a, um, a bonus section tonight, which Savannah oh. doesn't know about yet. Uh-oh. So, that'll be fun. I know, I'm scared. <laughs> so, Savannah, you ready for some facts? I am ready for some facts. Okay, let's, let's go hear into them. some facts. All right. So Avatar The Last Airbender was released from February 21st, 2005 to July 19th, 2008. Um, it was produced by Nickelodeon Animation Studio. So this was a, a Nick Jr. show, which was kind of surprising in a lot of ways, considering the usual audience. And now I'm thinking back to the <laughs> Nick Jr. of my childhood and... Obviously, I'm older than 2005, but <laughs> like when I watched Nick Jr. and those shows were very childish. Mm -hmm. There was Yo Gabba Gabba. Mm -hmm. There was Backyard Again. Backyard Again. There was a couple others that I can't think of. Yeah. Oswald. Oswald. I don't think I watched Oswald. A couple others. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess this would have been out when you were yeah 2005 2008. You would have been yeah. a kid. It's just I would have been too little to watch it though. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, so the yeah three to six that's a little young for uh, the show I guess so. Um, so yeah, there was a total of sixty one episodes. Each one was about twenty three minutes long. The show was created by Michael Dante Di Martino, 
and Brian, uh, Brian Konitska, Konitsko, they're very fancy names, so <laughs> I apologize for butchering <laughs> them. Um, the first one, Michael, is known for doing uh, Avatar, Last Airbender, and The Legend of Korra. He doesn't really have anything other in his resume. Uh, Brian, I guess, was a character designer before working on Last Airbender. He was the assistant director for some miscellaneous movies. And as of 2015, he was working on a sci-fi graphic novel called Thread Worlds, which has no release date. And it's been almost 10 years, so that's interesting. Is he still working on it? Who knows? That's weird. Yeah. Um, The music was done by Jeremy Zuckerman, who did The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra, as well as... Or it was also scored by uh, Benjamin Wynn. He doesn't really have anything else in his resume either. This stars uh, Zach Tyler Eisen, I believe is how you say it, as Aang. He did, um, he was in the backyard again. He was the penguin. Pablo. Pablo. Mm-hmm. Pablo. Um, May Whitman as Katara. She has the largest, out of all these actors, as far as I know, she has the largest um, resume. I think she's starting a lot of like teenage drama kind of stuff, naturally. Mm, naturally. <laughs> um, J- Jack DeSana? DeSena? I apologize for everyone for butchering these names. <laughs> he did Sokka. Um, Dante Bosco did Zuko. And Mako um, did Iroh as well. And also Greg Baldwin did Iroh, mm-hmm. which I'll go into. So he has two, two actors. And then, to my surprise, uh, Mark Hamill was in this. I don't think you know him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't But know. he's... Most famous for doing Luke Skywalker. Oh. Um, But he's also a very well-known voice actor. His best-known role is apparently doing all the animated Jokers. Oh. Like, he's the go-to guy for the Like in the Batman animated series? I don't... Yeah, I don't know, like, how long he's been doing. Mm. I guess so, yeah. Yeah. Because he's just... He's able to pull off that evil, sinister voice when he needs to. Interesting, because Luke Skywalker is not evil or sinister at all. No, he's not at all. But he did a uh, Fire Lord Ozai, which oh. is a fitting role, I feel. Um, so yeah, th- going back to Iroh. So the original actor, Mako, who apparently has done a lot of stuff, especially with uh, TV shows. Um, he ended up dying after they did the first two seasons of recording. He ended up dying from, I forget, I don't know how to pronounce this for sure. Where? Uh, esophageal, esophageal. Oh, esophageal cancer. Yeah, esophageal cancer. How sad. I don't know. That's sad. Um, so he ended up passing away, and the episode that tells a bossing say, where he ends up singing, the one song, mm-hmm. that the episode was dedicated to the actor. Um, so after he passed away, then the new actor Greg Baldwin came in, and you can. You could definitely tell the shift in terms of... Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like Iroh goes from being... Like, his speech becomes much smoother, yeah. I feel like. Yeah, he it's definitely different, and I'm sure they had to work around the actor differences, too. Um, apparently, in the Legend of Korra series, they actually named a character after Mako, and they named it Mako. Which I thought was interesting. Nice. I like how Mako doesn't have a last name. I know, it's just Mako. Yeah, so The Last Airbender is generally regarded by many critics and its audience as one of the best animated, one of the greatest animated television series of all time. Wow. According to Wikipedia. Um, it's received a lot of praise for its characters, cultural references, art direction, voice acting, soundtrack, humor, and themes. And especially for including certain themes that young, I guess more, um, whatever, children's television doesn't usually cover, which more includes, mature themes. yeah, like war, genocide, imperialism, um, some other things like that. It won five Annie Awards, which are awards specifically set aside for television. They're kind of like the Academy Awards of television. 
um, received a Genesis Award, a Primetime Emmy Award, and a Kids' Choice Award, which is very Nick, Nickelodeon, so I don't know if that sure. one counts. Um, and a Peabody Award. I'm not entirely sure what the Peabody Awards are, hmm. but that was listed, so I guess it's significant enough to be noted. So yeah, overall, it's very well loved by most people who watch it. Um, as we know, there was a movie <laughs> directed by M. Night Shyamalan. Um, and unlike the TV show, which is regarded as a masterpiece, the movie is regarded as one of the worst movies ever created. A disaster piece. A disaster piece. Um, and uh, hopefully you will never have to watch it. Yeah, just the trailer made me want to die. So. <laughs> However, there is a live action remake of the TV series to be released next year. Hmm. So we'll see how that goes. <clears throat> I I can't. I don't want to. I don't want to share my thoughts on it yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. So those were the the facts I found. <clears throat> Savannah, what were your thoughts and what is your history with the last airbender i don't really have a history with the last airbender i feel like i've kind of maybe heard of it growing up Mm -hmm. maybe but i didn't really have any clue what it was until you brought it up Mm -hmm. and until we started watching it do you feel this was I, i assume you've probably known about it for some time because my family loves it well, no, so, I don't remember. Really? I don't remember really even thinking about it until you brought it up explicitly. Really? Okay. Yeah, I've never. I think I don't even. I feel like this year was the not this year, but maybe within the last like mm, okay. calendar year. I feel like when we were kids, I remember mentioning it to you, but like you and your sister were like, "No, we don't watch that kind of stuff. We're more into like Jane Austen." Really? Did we say that? I feel. Huh? I, I think I remember having that conversation. That sounds like something I would say. <laughs> it's definitely something child me would say. <laughs> yeah. So what do you, what do you think about it? What are your general spoiler three, spoiler free, <laughs> excuse me, thoughts? Um, I enjoyed it. I was pleasantly surprised, and I was not expecting to love. Like I don't know. I I liked it. I feel like since we started, but in the beginning, I was a little like, hmm. Mm-hmm. But then as it got on, I, I very much liked it. And I was very pleasantly surprised, and I was sad when it ended. I know. It was it was very sad when it ended. Um, so, yeah, I have a long history with this, as I've explained before. Uh, this was probably my... Oh, this was my fourth or fifth time seeing this series. <laughs> um, my family loves, love, loves, loved the series. I'm, I don't know... If my younger siblings have seen it or would really remember it. Um, yeah, this was a big part of my childhood. I just remember being very inspired that this was a show that was made more accessible to a younger audience, but it was just, it was such a good story and such mm-hmm. a big and well done story. And it concluded very well. I just remember being very. In love with the fact that I could watch this and feeling really special that I could be able to watch this. Um, yeah, because TV shows weren't really something my family was really into, and this was one of the one of the few that we were into. Um, yeah, I I really like this series. I think this time watching it though, I definitely definitely was um, the most critical I've been towards it just because I'm, I'm older and time has passed since I saw last. So it's not perfect. Um, there's a lot to be said about things they could have done better or things that were just interesting. Um, but overall, I think when, when I think about this series, I still conclude that it is probably, or I was explaining this to you the other day. Mm-hmm. I was, someone asked me what I consider like the most I guess the best story mm-hmm. that I've ever heard, or ever been told, mm-hmm. and I, I think I gave an answer like something like The Count of Monte Cristo because I really like that book, mm-hmm. um, or I said something like Interstellar, um, and Lord, I was kind of I didn't really say Lord of the Rings because I was just kind of embarrassed to say that because these people were kind of expecting me to say that. Oh. But but watching this series, it I think it 
I think it's up there, if not the one of the best, just epic stories mm. that there are. Um, and we'll go into this later, but everything just ties in in the end so well, and you just don't see it from the beginning. It's but true. then it gets there, and you're like, wow, it went there, and it made sense that it went there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Anyway, um, so I'm probably going to do a lot more gushing over this. <laughs> You do a lot more gushing over everything that we talk about, to be Probably. fair. <laughs> um, if this was a book review podcast, and we were reviewing books that I recommended to you that mm-hmm. we read together, I feel like I would be doing more gushing. But I think so. This is definitely more your area. So. More my area. I mean, if we want to try a book sometime, just for fun. You could do that. You could do that. You pick a book, we read it. So now we're going into our uh, spoiler-filled conversation. Um We'll just kind of talk about each of the seasons and what our thoughts on them were and kind of our thoughts on the characters and, um, yeah. Yep. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Yep. And who. Um, so, Savannah, season one, you, you suggested that we break this into seasons because you mentioned, well, there was season one. And you just ended it at that. So I'm curious to know, what did you mean when you said that? Nothing bad. Um, Season one was just very childish in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, Lots more. I feel like there were a lot more silly sound effects throughout season one. (laughs) Although I will say, I think they continued through the whole thing. Oh, for sure. Um, But yeah, there were some... It was just... Yeah, definitely much more childish. The characters were very immature and childlike, which is understandable because mm-hmm. they were at the beginning of a grand adventure. Mm-hmm. And they have to be childish at the beginning of a grand adventure. That's true. Um, so yeah, I thought I thought season one was very season one. I don't remember a lot of it. I mean, I kind of, I can abstractly remember, mm, yeah. but like, that was, we watched season one back in like yeah, we watched February. Part of it. Yeah. And then we took a multiple month break and then came back. So um, I'm trying to remember exactly. We meet all the characters, Mm -hmm. all the main characters. Um, I think something that stands out to me is Zuko's character Mm -hmm. and just the kind of person he was in season one. Yeah. Um, And just, I, it was interesting to see everyone mature. Mm-hmm. But I feel like his character, as we'll talk about later, did a lot more maturing than the mm-hmm. other ones in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um. So that was cool to see. But yeah, all in all, season one was just... It was a lot of just them traveling around. Yeah. And like meeting animals and stuff. <laughs> so it wasn't like super epic at season one. It was kind of just setting the stage for the whole story. Yeah, it was a lot of world building. Um. And it definitely set up characters that would come back later, like uh, Jet was one. Um, And, well, was he the only, well, yeah, I guess he was the only character. Suki. Yeah, Suki, Jet, Suki. Um, There were other characters who came back who was, I mean, it wasn't necessarily as necessary that they came back. what was his name? The king, the crazy king. Oh, the king Boomy. Yeah. Yeah, he was more of a big character. Um because of his role in season two and three, but there was also the, whatever the guy's name was in the wheelchair, and then there was the earthbender from the village. They came back, but like, you know, whatever. But yeah, there was a, there was a lot of world building, so it didn't really feel like it was progressing quickly. Mm-hmm. It was just kind of, you know, we go here, we have an adventure, we go here and have an adventure. We, we're introduced to this concept, we're like, oh, okay. But then, you know, it comes back later mm-hmm. in some shape or form. Um, yeah, I, even in the first season, while I definitely agree it's definitely the most childish, um, there are definitely little things they have scattered in there that are very um, dark, even, and mature. Like, I think just in the second episode, Aang realizes the the genocide that was done to his people and, you know, stumbles upon mm. the remains of his people, which is actually very dark and sad. I know, boring. Um, which, yeah, that's that's not a that's not a light topic. Um, I think for me, when it comes to overall impressive story arcs this time around, Zuko is one I've always loved still. But Aang this time, I felt like I liked a lot more um, or appreciated a lot more. 
Um, just because he is a 12-year-old boy who's still a kid, but, like, by the end, he's very much changed because of the weight of everything that's mm-hmm. just been placed on him as the one having to restore balance to the world. Which is a heavy responsibility. I know, for anyone. Speaking of which, what do you think of Oppa and Momo? <laughs> I thought Oppa was cute. He did. I. I don't think. I don't think Momo really did that much for me. <laughs> but Oppa, I like Oppa. He was very wholesome and large. Yeah. And friend. Large friend. Yeah. And like I said, Momo kind of just followed everyone around. It's true. He was definitely there to keep the kids entertained. He was. Like Sokka was. <laughs> it's true, Sokka. Sokka is up there for one of your favorite characters, right? I liked him because I felt like. Like, okay, so I'm not a huge fan of, like, slapstick comedy. Not that it was slapstick, but, like, just really silly humor. Uh-huh. Um, but, like, I thought I liked that Sokka... Sokka did grow up and mature, but I feel like he also kind of... He kept things light sometimes. Yeah. And, like... But at the same time, I also am finding myself liking him because everyone hates him <laughs> and throws shade on him all the time, so I feel like I have to take his side. It's true. But, I mean, he was funny. He said some funny things. Is there anything? And he... No, I, okay. I can't think of a specific <laughs> line. But, like, I just feel like he grew up and matured. And he was a really good leader. And I feel like, honestly, he kind of carried a lot of the weight mm-hmm. of, like, picking places to stay and, like, making mm-hmm. strategies and whatnot. But everyone hated He definitely him. kept everyone going yeah. at times. Yeah. I think my favorite thing this time around with Sokka was his and Aang's random dynamic they'd have mm-hmm. sometimes. Like the Kata- bro dynamic. Yeah, whenever Katara was being a drama queen and mm-hmm. they'd just be in the background, you know, being goobers. It's true. I always found that very amusing. That was amusing. <laughs> what do you think about the ending of season one with Princess Yue and Sokka's relationship? Was that really the end of season one? Yeah. Wow. Um, I have a problem with all of the romantic relationships in the show. Because they're all so absurd and teenager-like. <laughs> Not even teenager-like, childish. <laughs> um, Sokka and Yue's relationship. Because, like, it's... I don't know. I just can't take it seriously because Sokka and Suki, like, meet each other and, like, kiss, I guess, uh, and, like, fight each <clears throat> other. But that's all that happens, right? It's true. They and don't then, really convince us that they're a thing. No. And then... Sokka meets Yue, which is much more convincing, honestly. That Their relationship is much yeah. more convincing. But it's very short-lived and dramatic because she's engaged with someone else, but they, like, fall in violent love with each other. And then it ends poorly. And then it ends poorly with her becoming the moon, which is sad. You can tell that that always stays with Sokka, mm-hmm. and he kind of feels sad whenever he thinks about it. Yeah. Um, But, like, I don't like that he and Suki got back together. <laughs> And, like, it just, I just, I, I didn't feel it. Yeah. The emotions of their relationship didn't really stay with me. But, anyway. But anyway. It was Anywho. a good ending to season one. Do you remember anything about the character general, um, Zhao? I feel like he was, I feel like he pales in comparison to the later villains, um, who come along. But I've... I don't know, I thought he was fine. I thought he was was good. he the guy on the Fire that Fire Nation ship guy? Yeah, he was Zuko's nemesis. Oh, okay. Um, he was this kind of buff, angry guy who wanted to kill the moon spirit. I kind of remember him. Okay, so I guess he wasn't that memorable. No, not really. Okay. So yeah, let's go to season two. So season one versus season two, what do you think? I think season two is definitely an improvement. Because what is we what do we see in season two? We meet Toph. We spend a lot of time in the Earth Kingdom. Mm-hmm. Most of the time in the Earth Kingdom. Yeah. Um Yeah, definitely an improvement from season one. Not that season one is bad. So yeah, I think season two, I this time around season two is my favorite season. Um I think the writing improved dramatically in this season. Because I felt like each episode was so much more full mm. than the previous previous season. Um, like, I just felt like there was a lot there, but it didn't feel rushed. Um, yeah, Aang has to learn earthbending now because he learned waterbending in the last one. Um, so, yeah, 
they kind of they start you know by going to little various adventures Aang learns about the the avatar state and kind of the weight of how important that is because someone's trying to see if get him to trigger it whenever he wants mm -hmm. but that kind of backfires and Aang starts beginning to feel regret and fear over what the avatar state can do especially what it did in the sec or first season especially towards the end um what was the first avatar state that he went into he went to that oh yeah it was because he saw his people that like got it to destroy right? yeah i think technically it was the first time was when he froze himself then he like responded to zuko like trying to hurt someone or something but yeah the big time that like it scared him was when mm -hmm. he saw his people and he got upset about that um so that's kind of set up at the beginning of the season to come back later when he meets the guru mm -hmm. um, who's going to teach him how to basically be in control of it. Um, open his chakras. Yeah, open his chakras. Um, we're introduced to Azula. Um, what do you think of Azula? Um, she was very creepy and very, I almost said demonic, kind of, <laughs> kind of though. Very bad. Mm -hmm. um, at first she just seemed kind of like a brat mm -hmm. but that was very short lived we definitely very quickly see that she's obviously deranged mm -hmm. um, which is fun <laughs> and she's so much better than Zuko at lots of things it's true like especially at that point like she's just like Z Zuko's cooler is she his older sister? younger sister really? yeah how sad how sad to have a younger sister that's cooler than you I mean her her dad liked her I'm like and he that's didn't like true. Zuko and that does a lot for you it's true um yeah she was pretty scary with her two scary friends mm -hmm. doing scary stuff I don't know mm -hmm. unexpected I feel like mm -hmm. she does make an important plot point and she's an important character mm -hmm. because she does some gnarly things as we'll talk about yeah we learn a lot about uh, Zuko's backstory in this season, too. Um, what did you think about that? It's very sad. Mm -hmm. Poor Zuko. I would probably become like him also if that happened to me. Yeah. The, um, the punishment from his dad being burned on one side of the face was gnarly. I know. That's really dark, actually. When you what, what, kind of, what kind of... Sorry, Morions. What kind of <sighs> dad would do that? Not a good dad. Burn his son's eye. I know. Um, but at least he did it in a very yeah. aesthetically pleasing pattern. <laughs> so he looks cool. It's true. I, I really like what they did with the royal family. I think the, Zuko, the Zuko's family. Um, it was just an interesting mix of people with Iroh and Fire Lord Ozai and Azula and then Zuko's mom. There's just a lot of drama and tension there. Mm -hmm. And you can understand why Zuko as a character is so conflicted in the way he is mm -hmm. um and i love how they end up wrapping that up in season three um yeah like everything just makes sense like oh he's not a total you know jerk he actually i, I kind of feel for him wanting to do this and kind of want him to to an extent mm -hmm. so that was well done yeah and of course we get a lot of iroh and zuko yeah we... together and i think this is you definitely started to like Iroh more towards the end. I did. He's definitely weird in a lot of ways, but I feel like we see the transition from, like, a lazy old man mm -hmm. for some reason, which is kind of the only personality trait he has up until a certain point. Until they get to the Earth Kingdom, I feel like. Mm -hmm. Almost. Well, maybe before. Well, yeah, I guess he just doesn't have... Like, you catch glimpses of him being more than that, but, mm -hmm. like, he just doesn't have a reason to show it. Yeah. He's just kind of there for Zuko and always mm -hmm. looking out for Zuko, even though Zuko is, is a total jerk to him. Mm hmm Which, that's not nice. Yeah. But he ends up being a good guy, a good old man. Mm hmm With some noble character traits. That's true. And some abs. And some abs, that's true. There's a lot of old, very old men with very <laughs> intense abs in the show, which is weird. I don't know what's what's going on with that. <laughs> Unrealistic expectations for men. Mm, that's sad. I know. <laughs> How would you, when you grow up and you're an old man and your stomach is not that ripped, you're going to be so sad. I know. I'm like, oh, man. Um, 
So we meet Toph. I know you kind of thought she was annoying mm -hmm. as a character. <laughs> she she doesn't really have a character arc in this series. She's just there. Yeah. Um, I think she adds a fun dynamic sometimes. No, she doesn't she, even go back to her parents. I mean... She just, like, literally abandons them. It's true, but, like, they're overprotective over her, so it's... So? 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 I That's, don't know. I like to... I, I take the sides of the parents. Always. Not always, but most of the time. Anyway. In huge. Yeah, I don't like Toph very much. Okay. Um, what do you think about the whole bossing say section towards the end where there is the dystopian elements to it um, where things weren't what they seemed it was very odd and like disturbing mm -hmm. but interesting that they went that route with the kids show yeah um it was it's always intriguing and disturbing to watch dystopian like things happen because you're always i don't mm -hmm. know it's always very like ah. i mean if that's what you, if that's what you want to describe it as. Yes, I don't know why that sound came to mind, but that is kind of how I felt. But yeah, it was good. I liked it. I enjoyed mm. that part quite a bit, actually. Yeah, I felt that was like where the writing at its strongest. Mm -hmm. um, like I think that was the peak writing in the entire series. Um, they just they had you hooked mm -hmm. at every moment because things weren't what they seemed, and you were at the edge of your seat because like, are they gonna be able to tell the king? Is the king gonna be able to help them? The the agents, the Daily, you know, they're really in control, but then Azula comes in and adds another dynamic trying to control mm -hmm. them and it's it's just yeah, I thought it was I thought it was very well done. Um and then there's then there's the ending to season two, which season two and season three have amazing endings. Season two was definitely it was more of a jaw dropper kind of ending. Um I don't know if you felt that way <laughs> watching it. You should tell the audience what the ending was. <laughs> should I? Mm -hmm. It was, so Azula comes in, she infiltrates and takes over the Dai Li, who then are now loyal to her. Zuko had a change of heart, seemingly, at some point, because mm. he released oh, yes. Appa, which was a story beat we didn't get. Appa got kidnapped, got kidnapped, which put Aang in a lot of distress, naturally. Mm -hmm. Um which I think was very interesting that they chose that route because it's not like, I, I, it's just unusual for a show, I think, for kids. Because, like, I remember as a kid watching it and feeling, being like, oh, they, he's not there and the main character is sad and struggling now. And for those who don't know who Appa is, Appa is the Avatar's flying bison. Flying bison. And best friend. I know. And pet. And pet. Yeah. <laughs> and he went missing. Went missing. He was, he was a... Bison napped, I guess. Um, but yeah, Zuko ended up finding. Oh, go ahead. This is very random, but I'm just gonna. Speaking of bison napped, there was a very interesting assortment of very creepy bad guy side characters in the show. Yeah. I'm thinking specifically of the face snatcher. Oh, that was a spirit. He Still, wasn't a well, he bad was guy. kind of a bad guy. He stole people's faces, which is bad. Well, spirits are neutral. Okay, fine. So, There's mm. creepy spirits. Also, the owl spirit was creepy. Really yes. creepy. Oh, that episode, too. Oh, there were so many good moments in season two. The library was another really good one. But the spirit world is full of very creepy things. It's true. So, yeah, I think Appa being taken away was an interesting dynamic for Aang's character in particular and the things he struggled with because of that um but yeah uh, Zuko ended up freeing freeing Appa after finding him imprisoned and he did that because his uncle essentially confronted him it's like well are you gonna kidnap the bison so you can kidnap Aang who's the avatar but like how are you gonna kidnap the bison in the city like where are you gonna keep him and it was this whole thing so Zuko let go of Appa or released him had to change. He comes in at the end and we're convinced like he's good because he's with his uncle, but then Azula kind of gets to him. And then we have the whole ending where he ends up betraying his uncle and betraying Katara's trust because they have a moment where they kind of build trust for a moment, which comes back later in the third season. Um, so yeah, there's the betrayal. And then Aang goes into the Avatar state, 
of his own accord because he just learned from the guru how to do that. But we learned at the beginning of the season that if you're killed during the avatar state, all the avatar or the avatar cycle will end and there will be no more avatars. Now, I don't know if Azula knew this, but um, she ends up essentially killing Aang. Thankfully, Katara has magic water in her pocket. Magic water in her pocket. Mm-hmm. 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 And she healed him. That's true. Brought him back to life. So that's how that ended, which is very... Um, yeah, it was a cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah, season two for me is definitely by far the... Not by far. It's definitely my favorite season, I think. Yeah, I think I, liked, I think I like season two the best, too. Mm-hmm. As far as the, like, the middle of it. Mm-hmm. And especially the end. Yeah. I think that that was definitely everything of its finest. Um, it reminds me... Well, as we go into season three, it kind of reminds me of, like, what a lot of people say about Lord of the Rings. A lot of people really like the second movie the best, which is interesting. I don't know if I feel that way. But the third one, season three, is a mix of, like, the highest highs and I'd say the lowest lows. (laughs) Because there's a lot of really good stuff in there, but there's also Mm -hmm. some stuff like, okay, that wasn't, that kind of wasn't necessary, or that could have been done better. Um, Do you have any immediate thoughts on season three? I think we should just start talking about it. You can share your thoughts and I'll chime in. What are some lows that you're thinking of that? Just some of the humor was... They kind of reverted back to, like, being too childish yeah. in some ways. And that was kind of annoying. Um, especially with Sokka at certain points. Um, it was just like, why? There was also a lot of teenage drama in season three. I mean, that, that, that one isn't... That one episode of them on the island. Oh, the beach. Yeah. That one was very drama. Very drama. I, I thought that was fine. Um, I mean, that was kind of the turning point for Zuko, Mm -hmm. I think. I think also some of the writing in this was a little sloppy, especially as you get closer to the end. Yeah, it starts off with everyone thinking the Avatar is dead. So Aang is kind of upset because he thinks that the world thinks that he failed again because he already disappeared for a hundred (laughs) years at the beginning of the show, which is... Awkward. Awkward. Um... So this one is just, it's got a lot of drama set up. It's got a lot of interesting things. Um, because we kind of experience all the characters, I think, in their most raw forms. Um, like, with this one, we get a lot more with Katara, especially with the just the bitterness she's been kind of hiding away about her mother being taken, taken away from, by the Fire Nation. Um, so we get, we get that sorted out. Um... Yeah, the first half of the series, Zuko's with the Fire Nation side, but he's uncertain of himself, and he keeps going back to his uncle who's imprisoned and, like, trying to get his help, but his uncle's not responding because he was betrayed by him. Um, And that's not going well for Zuko. Uh, We get introduced to Combustion Man. That's not his name. That's That's what they call him. What did you think of that guy? He was really creepy. The fact that he could explode things with his eye was, or his third eye was creepy. Mm-hmm. What do you think about um, Sokka pursuing his, I guess, sword mastery? That was kind of a random side plot, I kind of feel like. Mm-hmm. But it seemed like it worked out well for him. It did add to him, I think. You thought it added he to him? He got a cool man. sword. Well, I don't know, actually. I feel like when I think about Sokka at the end, I don't really think of his sword skills. Yeah. I think of, like, his leadership skills that he developed. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, I don't really feel like it... I didn't, like... I feel like it, we could have done without it. Yeah. Yeah, the whole concept of... <laughs> he... Yeah. It's kind of an interesting concept when you have a world filled with people who are too powerful because they can literally bend the world around them. And then you have a guy with a sword. It's true. Or boomerang. Or boomerang. Like, what What are you going to do? Against people who can literally hurl rocks at you. Yeah, poor Sokka. <laughs> um, there was the beach episode, um, which was, as we mentioned, that's kind of Zuko's turning point because everyone at the beach kind of, 
Well, he's with Azula and her other girl pals. Um, one of them is Zuko's girlfriend, May, who you despise with a passion. I don't despise her with a passion. She's just... She has a very dead inside voice and vibe, and, like, mm-hmm. she doesn't really... Like, Zuko, I don't know, it bothers me that Zuko likes her. He's too good for her. He's too good for her? Yeah. Okay. Um, but what did you think about that episode overall? I thought... Okay. Oh, sorry, no, you had... No, I was just saying, I remember you saying there was a lot... Um, you said something about it being a roller coaster. For better or for worse, I don't remember what you meant by that. It was, I mean, it was like they went to this island, like, vibe and hang out. Oh, because they went to this party... And then, like, people got mad, and they just went back and, like, mm-hmm. completely destroyed the whole party and destroyed this guy's house, which was a little rude. It's true. And then they go and have this heart-to-heart on the beach, the four of them, and talk about their hard childhoods and mm-hmm. stuff. And Zuko explains his feelings, and then he and his girlfriend, like, yell at each other a little bit, and they kiss. Wow. You know? That's how it is. Is that how it is? Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. But we learn in that moment that um, Azula is a psychopath and a sociopath. What she do specifically? Oh, that she doesn't have a soul at all. We learned that. I mean, just the story she tells and she just, she just is very cold and soulless. Mm. So there's the whole invasion plot, mm-hmm. which was set up in season two. Yeah. The day of the Black Sun, Fire Nation loses its firebending. Sokka... His dad and a group of people all plan a secret invasion um, to try and take out the Fire Lord during this short period of time. What did you end up thinking of that? I was portion? disappointing that it didn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of wondered, like, why did they even include that if it didn't, like, it didn't do anything? Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, I don't really feel like it was that consequential from yeah. what I recall. That was like a week ago that I saw it, so it's been a while. Yeah, because what Azula knew that the invasion plan long ahead of time because the Earth King and Bossing, Bossing and Say was a blabbermouth and kind of gave it away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a it was an interesting twist. It definitely was like, a, oh man, like I, I you know it's not going to work out because. There's a whole second half of the season. Well, to go. see, I didn't really know that, so I thought it was that was gonna be like the end. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. So you did you think the series was gonna end about there? Kind or? of, yeah. Okay. So I was a little surprised. Okay. You're like, what more story do they have to tell? Yeah, I was like, excuse me. But then Zuko, during that time, resolves to join the Avatar and teach him firebending. Everyone runs away. Zuko, where those, the, the invasion, you know, it flops. Those who get away can get away. We'll learn that the Fire Nation has invented uh, warships or like air air warships. What are they War called? War balloons. War balloons. Based off the invention in the first season from the inventor guy. The... No, he, he made them for the Fire Nation. Remember? No, he, he didn't... Um, he never, I don't think he ever showed them that invention because the ending of the episode was in the first season was the, their little war balloon crashed and the inventor guy was like, I'm not going to make weapons for the Fire Nation anymore. But that episode ended with the Fire Nation, you know, stumbling upon the oh, war balloon okay. being like, we have this, this secret now. Okay. So it comes back all the way in the third season. Now they have, you know, massive blimps. Zuko pursues the Avatar and his gang after they flee. He wants to convince them he's on their side. You know, they're not so convinced because he's chasing them halfway across the world at That's this point. Um, and then Zuko kind of goes off on a journey with each of the individual characters. Uh, they have a bonding moment. We learn about more of, of them and Zuko. Which one, which of the adventures do you think was your favorite? So there was his and Aang's, his and Katara's. Mm-hmm. Did he and Sokka do one? Yeah, the whole prison break. Oh, yeah. Uh, I like the prison break one. Yeah. The best, yeah. That was an inspiring field trip. <laughs> was an inspiring field trip? Yes, it was. <laughs> Poor Toph didn't get to go on a field trip with him. I know, how sad. <laughs> but yeah, I thought that was an interesting thing. And then we see Suki again, who I don't really like. 
Why don't you like her very much? Sweet. I don't know. She's just silly and kind of one-dimensional. That's true. She is pretty one-dimensional. I she think... She's just like Suki, Sokka's girlfriend. Also, speaking of that, their relationship, that one scene lives rent free in my head. Oh. Where Sokka's in his tent. <clears throat> that was extremely scandalous. Was it? Yes, for some reason it just struck me as very scandalous. When Zuko walks in, he's like, oh man, awkward. And like, Z Sokka's like in his pajamas and he has like a flower and the tent super decorated. <laughs> like, what are you guys doing at night in your tent? In your pajamas. I don't know. That was pretty bad. That <laughs> scarred me for life. Scarred you? Yes. I don't know if that's an accurate word to use, but okay. It did, it did scar me. Okay. Almost as scarred as Zuko was mm -hmm. by his dad. I think my favorite adventure was Katara and Zuko's. Um, Yeah, I liked all of them, but I just, I liked Katara's, and I know you didn't like Katara too much as a character. Mm -hmm. um, I like kind of how everything for her kind of came to a head at this point, like just all the frustration and bitterness that she'd been dealing with. She was, it just kind of came to a point where she started doing things that was very not herself and out of character in terms of trying to find the man who killed his her mom. Um, and the conclusion of that was interesting. Um, she didn't end up killing the person, as you know. And she's like, I can never forgive him, but I can give, forgive. Now I can forgive Zuko. But that, you know, Aang was like trying to convince Katara that violence is never the answer. Mm -hmm. But Zuko then poses the question to Aang, like, okay, so what does that mean for you when you have to face the Fire Lord, which this whole season, this whole series has been building up to? Mm -hmm. Um, and that was something I felt like they could have maybe established a little better early on was Zuko, not Zuko's, Aang's opposition to violence. To violence. Yeah. Because he, he did a lot of fighting. There was a lot of violence. Mm -hmm. He claims that he only did it out of self-defense or to protect people, which is true. It's just we never thought about it until he said it then. So I just thought that was a little last minute of a setup. Yeah, and I mean, him killing the Fire Lord would be in self-defense and to save people. It's true, but I guess maybe killing people directly as opposed to indirectly bothers him. <laughs> I don't know. Accidentally killed him. Um, but yeah, that brings us to the, the final the final part, the ending. Um, where we were kind of set up where Aang is opposed to killing Fire Lord Ozai, which everyone's convinced he has to do, including his past avatars. Um, apparently when the ending begins, they're like only three days away from Sozin's Comet, which was established in the first season, would bring the Fire Nation unbelievable power when it came to firebending. Scary. Scary. I know, because who needs that? Fire is already really scary. It's true. Um, and then Aang, oh, yeah, Aang's wrestling with that. Their plan was to wait until after the comet to take out the Fire Lord because the invasion plan failed and they don't think Aang is ready, but then they learn Oza, Fire Lord Ozai is planning on burning the Earth Kingdom to the ground, which, I don't know, I feel like they were kind of dumb for not foreseeing something mm -hmm. of that magnitude happening because they had unbelievable power. Yeah, I mean, what are they going to do with their unbelievable power? Just mm -hmm. sit there? I know. So there's that pressure put on them. And then Aang goes missing because he's on a giant lion turtle thing um, as he's trying to, you know, discover what he should do. Mm -hmm. Everyone goes off to find him. They rediscover, or they, they find Iroh who broke out of prison during the invasion. And there's that scene where he reunited, where Zuko reunited with him. You said that got you. That did get me. That definitely made me tear up. And I was... It was a very wholesome moment. It was a very wholesome moment. I was like, oh, that's so good. <laughs> yeah, that was a good part. That was definitely one of the highlights of the whole series. It was. Um, yeah, and then there's that. And Aang <clears throat> ends up having this weird conversation with the lion turtle thing. 
who like says some very vague stuff. Oh, the animation on the lion curl. <laughs> I was like, did it, was this guy just too big for them to like make move any part of his face at all? It was. I guess so. His jaw just kind of went up and down. Very unrhythmically, not in line with the words he was saying. I know. Um, but I guess the... I don't think it gave Aang power so much as it just gave him insight into something. Um, but all this kind of concludes to Katara and Zuko need to go face off Azula, who's now been deemed the new Fire Lord. And Zuko needs to reclaim being the Fire Lord, or his position, rightful position as Fire Lord, so he can bring balance to the world. Aang is going to face off the Fire Lord, as we know. Katara, not Katara, Sokka, Toph, and Suki are sabotaging the aerial fleet. And then the comet comes, and then everyone has, all the firebenders have unbelievable fire bending skills. <laughs> Did you have any general thoughts about that, this overall section? It was very scary. The whole vibe was just red. Mm -hmm. It was very like... Yeah, it was very scary. Um, no, I was definitely just, I don't know if this is jumping ahead, but I was definitely very surprised with how Aang ended up dealing with the Fire Lord. Yeah. Yeah. I was, at first I was like, oh, so his avatars were telling him to kill him. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be an interesting path for this show to take. So yeah. he's going to kill him because he has to. Okay, and then he doesn't kill him. But he ends up just taking away his firebending skills. Mm -hmm. I thought he was going to like defeat him with the power of love and friendship and they were going to like join <laughs> sides or something. So that was very interesting. Yeah. Nope. Didn't, didn't go that route. Yeah. I mean that was a good way to end it I guess. Mm -hmm. The Fire Lord was not repentant at the end. He was so not. I was surprised. Do you, do you feel like the fight between the two of them was just was earned well because they'd been building up to it the whole s series? Like do you feel like as it was approaching any sense of anticipation or was it just kind of like it's happening i feel like it was kind of anticlimactic a little bit oh really but i think it was i think when ang got like his when he got into the avatar state and was kind of like got his second wind it was much more interesting because mm -hmm. before it was just ang kind of getting running away i don't know pretty much <laughs> so but i thought it was i thought it was interesting it definitely did it feel well earned? I feel like it would have felt more earned if the invasion ended up working. Um, <laughs> I felt like it was more earned because it didn't end up working. Yeah, maybe. Like the defeat just leads to the victory meaning, meaning more. Yeah, so I guess a couple criticisms people have about the writing of the ending is the lion turtle magically appearing convenience, conveniently when Aang needs it to give him the insight about how to take away the Fire Lord's bending. As well as Aang just coincidentally hitting a rock that brings him back into being able to do the Avatar state. Oh, yeah, that was That was kind of... It was fine. It doesn't bother me enough to be like, oh, that took away from the enjoyment so much as like, oh, okay, I guess that was kind of lazy writing. Oh, well. It's true. That was quite convenient. Oh, man. Thank goodness everything's lining up the way it should for this. Good thing this rock gave him a chiropractic adjustment just in time. Phew. He was been done for without it. Especially since the guru, the like master of chakras, couldn't save him. I know. And then there was a uh, Zuko versus Azula. What do you think of Azula's ending? That was very pathetic and creepy. Very like, again, demonic. Mm. Azula definitely is possessed by something. <laughs> That was actually quite creepy. I feel like to young viewers, I know. that would have been distressing. It was, dis it was a little disturbing as a young viewer. Her, young me would definitely have her been Her psychotic distressed. breakdown towards the end. I think her friends betraying her is what triggered it. Because she realized she ultimately didn't have control over anybody in the way mm -hmm. she thought she did. So obviously she's being dramatic and bashing everyone. It's like, that's really weird. Um... But then Zuko and her face off. And I I love the choice that they gave Azula blue fire, especially for that scene. Like, I think it... The fact that she had blue fire was just creepy. Mm -hmm. But the fact that, like, you know, she and Zuko are blasting these waves of 50-foot flames at each other, but it's in true. different colors was actually yeah. really cool. I think this whole section just visually had a lot of really neat stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, and it... 
part of it is because it's a cartoon, like, you just don't appreciate it as much, I yeah. think. But, like, I was just thinking about, like, wow, that's actually, like, the imagery here is just really interesting. Like, mm -hmm. just some, yeah, like, I remember thinking that when Ozai was blasting lightning at Aang for the first time consistently amidst the rock formations, it was just, just the sights you see in this a world like this mm -hmm. are so bizarre and interesting. Yeah. Because, I mean, they definitely could have cut corners in that because mm -hmm. it is a kid's show, but I feel like yeah. they did a good job. They did, yeah. They, didn't, they definitely took full advantage of that. Um, but, yeah, Azula ends up getting the better of Zuko because she's tricks him because he get. I think he kind of gets a little cocky, isn't it? And she takes advantage of that because she's smart. Um, but then Katara ends up getting the better of her and then we're left with Azula essentially wailing and gnashing her teeth in Sheol because she's tied. Oh, that's really yeah, it was really creepy and actually really sad. Like, oh, mm -hmm. she's very pathetic. She is. Yeah, everyone wins. It's happy. Sokka does some dumb things to the Fire Lord, or says dumb things to the Fire Lord, which really bothered me this time. It did kind of ruin the moment. It's like, oh, come on, dude. Um, but then we get the ending, and, you know, Zuko's Fire Lord. Aang is... It fulfilled the avatar. Being an avatar. Everyone recognized him as the avatar. You know, we're gonna it's a new era of love and peace, as Zuko says. Which I'm curious to know how long that lasted. It's true, but we'll never know. We'll never know. Um, and then Aang and Katara kiss after three seasons of not really kissing. They, they kissed kiss once, once for the invasion. But that was Aang kissing Katara because he didn't know what was going to happen. And then he tried later on and Katara didn't respond well to it. Mm -hmm. And this time Katara initiated it. So That's it was Aang's, Aang's dream come true. It was. Do you feel like it was earned? Yeah, I just still, again, I can't take it very seriously because he's literally 12 and <laughs> she's 14. So It's true. No matter how mature they might seem, they're still like entire it's children. It's true. They're not just partial children, they're entire children. I mean, considering that he's 12, Aang is 12, he's very mature. He is. <laughs> he's, he's gone through way more than any other 12-year-old in the history of 12-year-olds. It's true. Yeah. It was earned, though. It was good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I felt like the closure of this, it's very Lord of the Rings for me. It was big. It was epic. It comes to an end in a satisfying way. It makes me feel everything I need to feel. There's a lot of ups and downs, a lot of, like, ups and downs emotionally in terms of, like, what they wanted me to feel. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel like it's very earned. It was a very earned ending. My only um, complaint is that Zuko goes to his dad, who's in prison, and he's like, where's my mom? And there's, like, music that makes it sound like they're going to go, like, find his mom before mm. the story ends, and they mm -hmm. don't, which is weird. Well, I, I didn't mind it, because it's just kind of continuing the story without continuing it. Mm -hmm. Because Zuko cares about his mom, but, like, it's not important to this story being told. Mm -hmm. When they explore it in, like, a graphic novel, I think they wrote. Um, but, yeah, it's it's not at all important to the, the primary story they were telling yeah. Aang and Zuko. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think this time around watching the series, I just appreciated the visuals of it more than I ever have. Um just with the once again the the crazy stuff that like what what would we see in a world where people could literally shape shift the environment around them or create mm -hmm. things and yeah there was just a lot of really neat stuff that happened visually the music um i know that's not your mm -hmm. <laughs> your forte but the music in this is good um i just wish they had amped it up a little more at certain points because it's so good but alas yeah, alas Overall, yeah, I think it's still one of my all-time favorites, and it's still a huge source of inspiration when I think of the types of stories that I want to be able to tell one day. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anything has come out like it since its release. There's just, yeah, was it? Lord of the Rings, Last Airbender. A lot of people would put Harry Potter up there with it, which I think is fair. It doesn't do as much for me, personally. Mm -hmm. I could see why. Yeah. Um, I want to watch Harry Potter again. Do you? Yes. I'm craving it right now. I've seen it far too many times, as you know. 
I have not seen it enough. <laughs> One day. Trust me, we'll have kids and they'll, that's all they'll ever want to watch and then you'll grow very sick of it very quickly. Maybe. Mm-hmm. So overall rating, like, I mean, I guess we're not rating it, but on a scale of one to five, what would you give it? Would you recommend it to people? Like, I guess in this case, if you're family, since they mm. haven't seen it and they don't seem like the type of people who'd really want to see this. But. Yeah. I'd give it a 4.5 out of 5. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like, I wouldn't give it a 5 because I'm like, this is the best thing I've ever seen, but it's quite good. Mm-hmm. I would recommend it. I would say watch this if you're looking for an interesting story. Mm-hmm. Not like watch this if you want to be like moved and inspired and changed because like mm. they you know you might. But I think it's a very good story. Yeah, I'd probably give it a four point five out of five. Um, I think the only things that hold it back from being a five is the first season being a little little childlike. Some of the writing towards the very ending being convenient. And just, like, the overall childish tone it has at points, because it is for... <laughs> Nick Jr. It is Nick Jr. Literally. And it's just... Some of it's fine. Some of it does make me laugh. Some of it is very unnecessary, and it's kind of like, eh, mm-hmm. whatever. But, yeah, that's good. It's it's one I would I would recommend in a heartbeat if someone was like, have you seen this? Like, oh, yeah, you should totally watch it. Um, so, Tom Hanks. Where does Tom Hanks fit in in all this? <laughs> I was thinking about that. I feel like he'd have to replace Zuko <laughs> or, uh, yeah, I think probably just Zuko. Really? Zuko or Iroh. Zuko or Iroh. I can see Iroh, not Zuko. I feel like I can see Zuko. <laughs> really? Yeah. Huh. I can't see that. I know. I'm just waiting for a movie where there's, like, an attractive young person, like, young male character, romance character, so I can rep- replace that's, him with that. Because that's, what? like, the... No, because so rom-coms are where I've seen most of Tom Hanks, so... Okay. Well, usually we'd wrap up our episode here, but we have a bonus section tonight. Oh, forgot about that. So we are going to do our uh, first live reaction. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to show Savannah the teaser trailer for the TV series coming out next year. See what she thinks. I've seen it already. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll we won't be played the audio over the recording because of copyright issues and whatever. I don't know. I don't know how that works. I don't want to look into it. Um, but I guess if you want to watch along then start now. interesting this is this is giving the avatar movie vibes for some reason yeah Got a lot of commentary here. <laughs> I have thoughts. That's really not bad. Netflix presents. Oh, that music is very much nodding to the series. <laughs> Big epic moment. Is that Opera, Momo? Katara is like twice Aang size. <laughs> I mean, she's, I don't know, it's the coat. February 22nd. Wow. Netflix. Very nice. Very nice. I would watch it. Would you? I would. It's funny, though, because, like, they all look like their age. And they all look like <laughs> in, entire children. They are entire children. They are. And also, Katara was literally twice Aang's size. 
I don't know if that's true. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, I thought it looks okay. I mean, I'm not like, wow, that looks epic, but like, it looks interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm apprehensive. Um, the CG, I'm gonna be honest, looks bad throughout all of it. Is that surprising though? I feel like these days you don't. Really it's just it's CG. too much CG. Like I don't know. It's not really the point of everything that's going. Uh, is it whatever? Doesn't have to do with the story, but like it just it's a red flag to me. Mm, yeah. Because I know a lot of this story has to revolve around a lot of special effects because of the world building. But I don't know. I think they should just find this actual just... <laughs> Ben. I just there's a better way to do it. I know there's a better way to do it, and. I don't know. I just don't have good hopes for this one. I'm going to be honest, but we shall see. We'll see what people say about it. It's true. I don't know. I'm kind of, yeah. Anywho. Like I said, though, the music was nodding to the series. There it's true. Some. I wonder if they'll keep the same themes or not. Yeah. I mean, it looks it looks decent. Decent. Yeah, it doesn't look terrible. But, yeah, the whole CG thing, like overloading the world right now is really bothersome. Yeah. I think back to Lord of the Rings. Think back to Lord of the Rings. Just the glory days. The glory days. The pinnacle of all pinnacles. It's true. The highest peak of all peaks. I know. Even Narnia. Even Narnia? Even Narnia was an act of magic. An act of magic? Yes. And not too much CG, even though... Oh. Even though there was a lot of there CG. There was a lot of CG, but like it was convincing. And mm. yeah. they didn't rely on it the whole time. Like, it's true. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, it's time for us to wrap up and get ready for, for bed at this point because it's late. Um, but, yeah, thank you all for chiming in, for listening. Let us know what you thought in the comments. Um, what's your history with The Last Airbender? What do you think about it? Um, we hope that this has inspired you to have more conversation around um, the TV or movies you're watching. But, yeah, until next time, um, goodbye. <laughs>